My name is Vicki Matson. I'm the Director of Field Education here. For the last 10 or 12 years or so, every other year our school has been on a pattern of taking groups of students to the U.S.-Mexico border. I had the privilege of going on that trip for four years, and I must say it was one of the most impactful professional experiences I've ever been a part of. And our students through the years who participate in these trips, you see it showing up again and again in their learning uh, and even the senior projects. Um, so it's my pleasure. pleasure this morning to introduce to you my friend and my colleague, Amy Steele, who serves as our Dean of Students, but is so much more than that. Uh, she, um, uh, with the help of two uh, PhD students in, th in our Theology and Practice program, Kyle Brooks and Peter Capretto, took a group of 16 student colleagues to the border this summer, and uh, we are so blessed to have, you, have all of you here this morning to, to hear your reflections. Join me in welcoming them. Good morning, and thank you, Vicki Matson. <laughs> um, I had the pleasure, it was two years ago, of traveling with Vicki uh, for the first time to the border, and it was an incredible experience. Um, since I have gone now two times, I can say that each time that I've gone, both times that I've gone, um, were, were extremely impactful. Um, two totally different trips, really. Um, so if you've heard this talk before, you really haven't heard this talk before, <laughs> so I invite you to listen with new ears. Um, one of the core things that we try to get at in teaching this class, um, if you remember, it's Div 4, um, 116, um, Traversing Our National Wound, U.S. Immigration at the U.S.-Mexico Border. One of the things that we try to get at is understanding immigration in the borderlands. So understanding immigration um, sort of there in Tucson, Arizona, um, and then along Nogales, um, um, Mexico. And we encourage everyone in the class to really be engaged. Um, it's a, a full-bodied experience. Um, not only are we sort of sharing analysis about the history of immigration and um, thinking about theological and economic implications of immigration, um, in communities in Arizona and throughout um, northern Mexico, we are also just deeply engaged. It, it's really hard to, um, to describe the experience. I mean, we've got folks here today to sort of give um, their reflections about how it had impacted them. Um, but one of the things that I'd like to share uh, since the, this breakfast, uh, since we couldn't take this breakfast to the border, we brought the border to you. And our artist, um, one of the students from the class, Lori Curring, is going to say a little bit more about the border wall that sits before you. Um, it is a phenomenal replica of really what we encountered at the border. Um, and one of the things that I want to share very quickly, because I think you'll hear and uh, appreciate the stories of our students even more, um, one of the stories that I, I learned two years ago about the border wall, which is really a recent um, establishment, um, as recent as 2006, uh, they start building the wall. One of the things that we learned is that uh, the wall uh, actually, this shorter wall is probably uh, a better uh, replica of the initial wall, so the, sort of the first installment. And the children uh, on both sides of the border used to play volleyball. <laughs> um, and so you can see how um, over the years the wall has gotten taller. It's not the same in every place, um, but... Um, the, the wall that we encounter along uh, Nogales, Arizona, and Nogales, um, Mexico, really is reminiscent more of this taller structure here. And so I'm not going to take away from what Lori, the artist, uh, tries to encapsulate um, in this rendition of the wall, but just know that there are sort of moving pieces to, to today's presentation. Um, before we continue with the... Um, with our list of, of presenters, our list of um, folks that are going to be reflecting on the trip, I wanted to invite Sierra, uh, if you would please, just come to the mic 
and say a little bit about, there's going to be a, uh, a, a moving presentation, and I'm going to invite her to say a little bit about what that is, to explain uh, her uh, reflection and how the desert, in fact, uh, impacted her. And then later on, you're going to hear from Kyle Brooks, who's one of the TAs, uh, Peter Capretto um, as well, another TA, TF, excuse me, teaching fellow, uh, Priska Mojica, who's going to do a dramatic spoken word piece. Christy Joe is going to actually tell more about the itinerary. Um, and then Kate Worley is going to give a reflection. And Rhonda Siggers, Kathy Crimmy, and then Lori Curring uh, will wrap this up with an explanation of her art piece. And then I'll say some closing remarks. So put your hands together for Sierra. Good morning. Um, what I tried to do with my visual exhibit was capture the journey in the desert. Um, it's very, very intense conditions in the desert. And so while we were walking through the desert, I just wanted to get a small image of what that journey might have looked like for some of the people. So there are um, words on the ground that kind of describe the emotions that people may have been feeling while traveling through the desert or in preparation to go through the journey. So if you haven't already, the models will get into place and I just encourage you to come by and see my visual expression of what the desert experience um, was for me and how it impacted me. Thank you. Good morning. My name is Kyle Brooks, and I was a teaching fellow for the Border Links trip this year. A few words came to mind from the first epistle to the Corinthians, the 13th chapter and the 12th verse, which says, For now we see through a glass darkly, but then face to face now I know in part, but then shall I know even as also I am known. The idea of dark glasses, the idea of lenses through which we view the world, is an idea that is not foreign in the desert space of Nogales, both in Arizona and in Mexico. It might manifest in the dark lenses of your Ray-Bans as you're protecting your eyes from the sun. And not only from the sun, but also the reflection off of the sand, off of the often bleak landscape of the desert. It might be reflected in the darkly tinted glasses of Border Patrol agents looking out onto this very same landscape with very different eyes from the average citizen. It might be reflected in the dark glass tinting the vehicles we rode in as the landscape became, in some ways, not merely a desert, but a place of contention, an odd sort of place of tourism, but also a place of life and death a place in which we encounter lives and landscapes that are transformed remarkably by how we see through a glass darkly. I'm reminded that sunglasses often have polarized lenses. There's a kind of polarization that happens in the way all of us see the world, particularly around issues that affect us deeply and emotionally issues that cause us to consider what are the grounds of our morality and our ethics, particularly with respect to issues of borders. What is a border? Who determines borders? Who defines what belongs on either side? These are not things without histories. We can look at the history of this nation that we're presently occupying, the United States, and we can see a history of borders erected and borders violated, borders ignored, 
borders imagined. And in many ways, the wall that we observed along our, our trip and during our time in Nogales was many of those things all at once. Yes, there's a physical structure, but the physical structure is merely the reinforcement of an ideological concern. It is a means of demarcating what some might say is merely the division between two different countries, which is fascinating when you think about how many places now in this United States are named after places, named in languages that we consider foreign or other. The entire state of California, as I recall, that is not an Anglo-Saxon word. I spent the other weekend in San Diego and thought, here I am on American soil so close to soil that is considered other, that is considered distant. What, is, what do I mean by all of this? What I mean is that when I look at a wall through my darkly tinted lenses of ideology, of morality, of faith, of nationalism, of patriotism, whatever lens I've chosen to use in viewing this world, I'm reminded that through the slats of these gates and these walls, there is a world not so far away, and yet so distant, and made distant, and kept distant by ideology. The greatest takeaway I've had from this trip is not some grand reimagination of the world. We know it's unjust. We know that it often inflicts borders upon those who are perhaps most in need of policing, most in need of control, most in need of captivity. But what it forced me to remember is that in my own ways, I'm seeing through dark lenses and imagining the world, sometimes in ways that are unjust, in ways that are not lovely, in ways that are not righteous. And every day, I must struggle for better understanding I must struggle to recognize that what I have called foreign and other is really not so far apart from me. And that in some ways we are all foreign to someone and to something. The border is merely a structure, but it is not one that cannot be overcome by our willingness to see and to hold one another in mutual regard. Thank you. The homiletician is a hard act to follow, jeez. Um, <clears throat> my name's Peter Capretto. I'm another uh, fellow in theology and practice and had the honor of being a part of this course. Um, for those of you with a theological education or just some experience working in churches, one of the natural concerns about uh, immersion work you probably have is the model of the mission trip. It's a group of people marching into a space that's not their own, being able to say that they've been there, and naturally having a great Facebook profile picture for the summer. Um, I won't lie, uh, I had a lot of these concerns for myself whenever I joined as a part of this teaching team. Immersion learning isn't as simple as immersing yourself in the world of a contested political and theological space like Nogales. Even cultural sensitivity often gets you only so far in a space like this. It's one thing to know what not uh, to say and how not to act in a space so as to not disturb uh, persons in communities that have already experienced a lot of fragmentation. It's another thing entirely to align your presence and your embodiment in a way that others feel, if nothing else, affirmed in their struggles for a moment. Um, if I can give any testimony to the students of the Divinity School, <laughs> it is without question the vision that this group of scholars, ministers, uh, and activists have in um, unscripted moments to relate to people in this border region without voyeurism or without condescension, but with something that resembles uh, genuine care. 
Uh, I say this as a, a pastoral caregiver, someone who's supposed to be offering genuine care all the time. It's hard. Um, whenever we were in Nogales, Sonora, on the Mexican side, we visited one of the shelter sites of Grupos Beta, uh, a human rights service organization of the National Institute of Migration. Um, in this space, persons from throughout the Americas found brief but profoundly needed shelter, food, and care as they were making their travels, most often as a result of political strife from their homes. Um, stepping into this space to meet persons and hear their stories was delicate and dangerous. Uh, introducing more strangers into an already precarious space often can have a very negative effect, further fragmenting an already unstable situation. Uh, but as our group dug deep for a way to lend an ear, and as I found myself unsure of whether we should even be there, uh, I looked around and found generosity and hospitality emerging from our group in ways that I hadn't even imagined. Uh, stories were being told, yes, uh, hardships shared that too. Um, a man finding shelter at Grupos Beta was giving haircuts with electric shears to a large crowd of persons one at a time. Someone in the line mentioned uh, how long the wait was because there was only one person they could trust to give a good haircut. Um, this was when uh, Sarah Jennings, she's not here today unfortunately, <laughs> she asked, uh, do you have another pair of shears? At this moment, I was like, oh, God, this is not going to be good. Um, but uh, she was serious. Um, someone said, no, this is the only one we've got. Uh, but another person with uh, long hair turned to her and said, uh, do you know how to braid? She said, yeah. Would you like me to braid your hair? Uh, the reason why I was floored by this as I watched Sarah begin to braid this man's hair was not what you might expect. It's easy uh, to talk about the way that we Vandy folks cross borders and uh, enter into another space, that we got our hands dirty. Uh, there was no pretense of this, and I think the people in this group knew what was problematic of thinking in those terms. Um, the problem is that the line between compassion and colonialism in a space like this can often be so invisible uh, that you just can't even tell the difference much of the time. Um, as I was looking at her braiding this man's hair, I was thinking, is this just another space that we are grooming and making to our liking, making to seem and appear in a way that was pleasing to what us Vandy folks uh, were expecting? What floored me was how clearly this wasn't the case. Uh, this was a rare mo moment of mutual invitation, of support that didn't pretend to be more than it was, but nothing less either. Even if short-lived, their conversation didn't skip a beat. Uh, Sarah wasn't just immersed in his world, but he was immersed in hers as well. Uh, this moment was salient for me, but it was characteristic of uh, the experiences on this trip. Uh, one of the more humbling things is that um, it's really difficult to get a sense of how to cultivate exactly this sort of spontaneity and this ability to care in an unscripted way. Um, but as someone who's been sh uh, shaped significantly by the Vanderbilt Divinity Education um, in a number of ways, I can say rather confidently that the quality of care, respect, and mutuality that our group showed tells us that uh, we're doing something right. Uh, and that made me feel good. That's all I got. Hello. <laughs> So, um, I'm an immigrant. I was born in Nicaragua, and so the way I encountered a lot of what was happening was really different, I think, than a lot of my peers. Um, and I think I forget, because I grew up around other immigrants, that people don't know the stories and people don't understand, like, the different types of visas, or even when I've told people, oh, I have a green card, so you're not a citizen? I'm like, I have a green card. That's what that means, you know? <laughs> so in this learning process that people were taking, I was en encountering and re-encountering in a different way. So for me as a mujerista, it felt important for me to say something in this moment. It's not necessarily spoken word, but it was the only way I could say, like, I felt like I should have titled it, like, a mujerista moment. But this is what's happening. There are no borders that can keep us out. My father has many reasons to explain why we came to the United States. There were promises of better futures and opportunities for him, but most importantly, for his kids. 
There's a popular joke told among many Nicaraguans where a man gets to the U.S. and finds a $50 bill in the ground. He picks it up on his first day in the U.S. and says, Wow, aquí el dinero se cae del cielo. Wow, money really does fall from the sky here. And he puts the, do- the $50 bill back on the ground and thinks to himself, Tomorrow, I'll start picking up that abundance that flows through the skies of the United States of America. My dad saw the kingdom of God's golden roads in the United States. The fucking kingdom of God was realized in the United States of America for my dad. I remember him telling me stories about the clear rain that poured through the entire country that you could bathe in it. I was told about flushing toilets. I was told about pretty and clean schools. You see, in Nicaragua, we were poor. I was a sickly kid who suffered from malnutrition. And I was even, I wasn't even six years old and had had hepatitis, cholera, born with jaundice, varicella, and a kidney disease that plagued my entire fifth year of my life. My brother and I attended public school, which meant we were in the company of the poorest children in the capital. The house that we owned was not ours, but because empty homes were left throughout the entire country after the civil war that Nicaragua experienced in the 70s and early 80s, the government began to allow people to walk into these abandoned homes and claim them because there were so many of them. My dad longed for us to have a better life. My dad longed for us to have opportunities that were never going to be ours, considering how poor we were and how poor we were to remain if we stayed in Nicaragua. My mother had many reasons as to why she did not want to leave and come to the United States. There were rumors about gangs and violence in the barrios that many of our family and friends, our family friends that ended, had ended up living in. My mother heard of drugs and of guns and did not want us exposed to that. Other moms told my mom, en los Estados Unidos tienes que cuidarlos más. In the U.S. say you have to take care of your kids more. We were told about the loss of values that occurred in assimilation. We were told about the disconnect between children and parents that is overpowering because children pick up the language faster and learn how to make it. And parents become reliant on their children for translating everything for them, thereby shifting dynamics unless the parents learn to catch up. Not only that, but the dangers we faced in Nicaragua came in the form of lack of food and lack of medical care. But in the U.S., there's an apathy for black and brown folks, and we knew this back home. In the U.S.A., we might not go hungry, but we will be shot by the police and controlled and patrolled by white people who see us as inferior because of the color of our skins and the accents in our tongues. I have over 74 cousins in my mother's side of the family, and I don't even remember how many cousins I have on my dad's side because his family is significant, significantly bigger. My mom didn't want to leave our families, our support systems, our foundations. My mom had friends, best friends she had grown up with. You don't raise kids alone in Nicaragua. You raise them alongside a slew of comadres who love your kids as much as their own. To my mom, the United States signified dangers, loneliness, and loss. But I was a sickly kid, and the poverty we experienced was dangerous for my and my brother's development. You see, there's a myth about immigration, and it's the belief that everyone who ends up in the United States wants to be here. But we forget that many of us left our abuelos and abuelas back home. My mom left our bro- her brothers and sisters. My dad left his mom. We leave our hearts in these countries we migrate from. The men we saw in Operation Streamline bore the faces of my uncles, primos, and papi. And I think there are many reasons why these hermanos want to cross the border and come to the United States. And there are many reasons why they don't. But no matter what fence is up, people are going to keep crossing them for their kids, their wives, their partners, themselves, because someone's life is oftentimes at stakes. Por eso mi gente gente lucha contra las leyes racistas en Arizona. No creemos en fronteras. Cruzaremos, cruzaremos, cruzaremos. That is why my people fight against racist laws in Arizona. 
and we don't believe in borders, we will keep crossing, crossing them, crossing. Thank you. So I'm Paige, I was on this border trip. And I'm Christy Jo. Huh? And I'm gonna help her talk about our itinerary. <clears throat> um, so the first day that we arrived in Tucson, Arizona, uh, we went to Border Links, and then we chatted with a woman named Lupe Castillo, and she's a local historian who works with Chicana rights activists in the area, and she helped orient us to the geography. Um, the next day, we went to Southside Presbyterian Church and um, met with the Southside Workers Center. Um, and they run out of the church to help connect workers who are primarily Spanish-speaking immigrants with employers and work to make sure that those employers pay their workers the right wages um, and work on their behalf to ensure that the workers are not taken advantage of. Later that day, we also met with David and Carolina from Casa Mariposa, uh, which is based in Tucson. It's a community model that helps build relationships and share resources um, and build solidarity with those being oppressed. Um, and they also work for peaceful and nonviolent resistance, um, specifically among those who have come over. David and Carolina were both people who experienced the detention centers and shared with us the very harsh realities of what it was like to be there. Um, the next day on Saturday, we went on the desert walk um, with Paula and John from No More Deaths, which is a coalition of individuals um, from faith communities, human rights advocacies, and grassroots organizations um, that join together to provide uh, water and care for those who are experiencing the harsh conditions along the U.S.-Mexico border. Um, they support and aid migrants who are trying to cross, mostly through water stations um, and through patrolling the desert for migrants who are in need. Um, they took us on a walk through the desert um, and showed us a, a trail that is used by migrants um, and so that we were able to think about um, what it would be like to traverse these conditions, even though we in no way experience them the same way that those who cross do. Um, on Saturday, we um, attended, or on Sunday rather, we attended a service at Southside Presbyterian Church and later talked with John Fife, who was a huge leader in the sanctuary movement from the 80s. Um, he shared with us about what Southside has done in the sanctuary movement and about his personal experiences as being a person of nonviolent resistance in the midst of immigration issues. Following that, on Monday, we went to tour the Border Patrol Station, and that included um, an SUV ride through, um, through the area, even to the wall. Um, it was quite moving, and um, I don't think words or pictures could ever fully explain to you what we experienced when we visited with the Border Patrol. We also went through and toured the Industrial Park and the Maquilas, which are the foreign or U.S. owned uh, manufacturing plants that most likely work under the Border Industrialization or NAFTA, a program that uses Mexican labor to produce foods to export. And usually they are under a free trade treaty, meaning that their taxes and tariffs are minimal. On Tuesday, we met with Grupos Beta. It's a group who offers migrants who are heading north information on the deserts and its dangers as well as their rights. And once they cross into the U.S., they are offered limited shelter and food um, to repatriated migrants and work with Mexican consulates in the U.S. to locate missing people and to coordinate rescue missions. We also um, met with the West Grove Kino border, which was on the U.S. side. And that's an innovative and cooperative effort between six major religious organizations that strive to accompany migrants and their communities affected by the consequences of migration. It is um, strategically loca located in the Twin Cities of Nogales in Arizona and Northern Sonora, which is a major port of entry and deportation for migrants in the Southwest. On Wednesday, we also went to visit San Xavier, a beautiful cathedral in Arizona. We, following that, we went to Operation Streamline, which began in Tucson in January of 2008. 
This is a zero tolerance program targeting migrants who have been apprehended along the Arizona border with Mexico. Based on other initiatives begun in Del Rio, Texas and Yuma, Arizona. This initiative aims to process 100 migrants with misdemeanors and then deport them, thus setting the stage for stiffer and longer penalties for repeated offenders. While this itinerary was really brief and Paige and I just wanted to highlight a few of the major things that we did there, we hope that you'll take time to check out the small glimpses in the PowerPoint um, photo slide that Julia Nussbaum, a graduate of VDS, helped us um, put together and she was also um, traveling with us to intentionally be our photographer to capture some of these life-changing moments. I want to briefly share with you a story that was most moving to me. I'm a second year MDiv student and a candidate for the ordination process for the Disciples of Christ. And I was particularly interested in what charity and justice looks like in congregational ministry. Therefore, when we met the retired minister, Reverend John Fife, I was elated to hear from him. He was the minister, like Paige shared, that was part of the church that first began the sanctuary movement in the 80s. He shared with us his experiences and his narrative, his hardships of life on the ground, not sugarcoating his hard work and experiences, but making them come alive through his demeanor. What stood out to me most was when Reverend John Fife said something like this, for 10 years, I was running ragged. With all the work that I was doing, the sanctuary movement was at such a momentum that 70% of my work at the church was related to that, the sanctuary movement. But the church supported and agreed that this was what I was supposed to be doing. I cannot imagine looking back at my career as a pastor and think, wow. Over the course of my time, I've made a lot of friends and a little bit of money but nothing else happened as a result of my ministry. He said, I wanted to look back and say, wow, I really did something, and I am grateful to participate in something significant like the sanctuary movement. I was reminded that our callings aren't oftentimes comfortable, yet our callings are significant and must be taken seriously. Hi, my name is Kate Worley. I am a second year MTS student, and I would like to share a story with you um, about our trip into Mexico. Um, the first stop on our agenda as we crossed the border um, into Mexico was at a large grocery store. Our team was split into small groups and given lists of foods to find and record their price. Take a moment to think about the breakfast that you've just eaten. Many of the foods that you have just had were on our lists. Foods such as eggs, coffee, fruit. Um, keeping in mind that the average worker in Mexico makes just $4.77 a day, I'd like to share with you what we found and how much these food costs. In the grocery store, a dozen eggs cost $1.87. A cup of coffee from a place like Starbucks costs $2.16. A kilogram of fruit costs $2.29. And cheese could cost up to $5.74. It was shocking and saddening to, to think about the hunger that many Mexican, fa Mexican families face as a result of this disparity. This experience led me to think deeply about the unjust dis distribution of resources in this world. I hope that my reflection will cause you to do the same. Thanks. Good morning. Um, my name is Rhonda Siggers and I am a third year, hopefully to be graduating in May, um, div student. <laughs> um, just really quickly, um, one of the reasons why I was interested in participating on this trip was because I grew up in San Diego and I have family on both sides of the border. And so I was curious to see um, what the dynamics were at play 
that are different in San Diego than Nogales. And it was a stark difference. Um, and I have to say that after being on this trip, a lot of things were confirmed for me. Um, the biggest thing that was confirmed for me was that it is time for me to go back home to California and that my work is in education and that it is my ministry. And I was just reminded of the experiences that I had growing up on the border. I was also reminded of the experiences that I had as a teacher on the border and the experiences that um, I shared with a lot of my students who were, many of them were undocumented and their parents were not comfortable in coming into my school. And so what I often had to do was go to them. And, sorry, I'm trying not to get emotional. Um, I realized the difficulties that they face and Project Streamline broke my heart. To see people in shackles, to know that they probably didn't understand what they were saying yes and no to, it was a humbling experience. And I think that it made, I saw distinct parallels between the visual of Africans in shackles and the struggles that they endured forcibly and I'm just reminded that there's still work for us to do. And my hope is that as a community here at Vanderbilt, that we are committed to that kind of work. That this trip wasn't in vain, that this trip wasn't just for show, but that we are willing to step up and make a difference where it counts. Thank you. Hi, I'm Kathy Crimmy. Um, I'm actually full-time staff here at Vanderbilt, so, um, but I'm actually now classified as a second-year MDiv student, so I just am on the really slow track. <laughs> so anyone that worries about not graduating in three years, I had no expectation that would happen. <laughs> um, so I want to give you a little bit of background of why this trip was important to me. Um, I am the, and I probably will get emotional, <laughs> so maybe I should have set the the, the bar a little bit lower for everybody so they didn't have to worry about it. I am the daughter and great-granddaughter of immigrants to this country. Um, my father with his family immigrated from Italy actually in three waves. My grandfather came to this country escorting his two sisters as mail or brides um, to two Italian brothers who lived in California. Um, it, my grandfather borrowed the money to do that. Then it took him five years to pay back what he borrowed and save up enough money to bring his wife and three of his five children here five years later. Um, the older two boys had to remain in Italy because they had to serve in the Italian army before they were allowed to immigrate out of Italy. Um, so, my, and on my my mother's side, my great-grandfather immigrated here in, we're not exactly sure when, but probably the 1870s, as probably an older teenager or maybe a young 20-something adult, leaving his family behind and just coming here for opportunities. He came here on a six-month work visa, which he was supposed to go back to Germany and then serve in the German army after that. Six months was up, but he chose to stay here, so he became an undocumented individual in this country. And yet there was, you know, well, there were, there were never any stories that were passed along on either side, really, of the really s fears and dangers that both these families encountered. And... Having three children of my own, I understand that because you want to raise your children to not be fearful of the world. You want them to have, be somewhat realistic, but, but you don't want the fear of the bad things to hang over their head and, and cripple them for what they do in the future. So it, there was a lot in growing up 
Um, our focus was always on being American. Um, we were not allowed to learn either language. We were only allowed to learn English so that we would always appear to be Americans and not appear to be from our heritage, even though we, you know, we interacted regularly. You know, I, you know, all of my relatives on both sides, I truly loved and felt embraced by, but that it was very much made clear to us to leave those cultures behind and be American. And it's only been really in the last 10 years, around 10 years ago, through truly an act of God, um, I became really involved in a lot of work through the church across various cultures. Um, and was then trained as an anti-racism facilitator and have been spending the last, a lot of the last 10 years of my personal time um, working with various groups uh, as well as white people. A couple years into that, I was asked by our national church to be part of a group who created an association whose main focus is to address white privilege in both our church and society. So we, um, but we have to have partnerships with other ethnic and cultural groups because um, as we, as many of us white people know, we fail horribly at trying to fix the privilege and all that goes with that in this country by ourselves. We have to have the voices of other cultures to be able to understand what their experiences are and, and to help us understand all of, all of the things that we've been taught and we take for granted that we think are okay but have really bad adverse effects on other people. So um, building relationships and alliances with people of other cultures is just paramount to a lot of the work I do um, the other motivation that I had is I did attend four years ago the breakfast that was held um, after the group that went to the border. And I knew that it so much aligned with the work and kind of conversations that I'm involved in that I had, I had to be part of it. I had to have that experience because I know that even though I understand what my experience as a child of an immigrant is, I know that's not the same as the experiences of other people who come from other countries and through other situations. So what my background taught me that um, was rein reinforced a lot in this trip was about all the deceptions that we're taught about what it is to be American um, and, and what, what the price that we all pay in giving up cultural things um, to, to assume that identity. And the reality is there are lots of people who never can, no matter what they do or say, or um, try to mold into will never, because of the color of their skin or language or whatever, they are, they'll never be truly this, what, you know, I grew up, being taught was the melting pot, which I really find so offensive today. Um, but also, one thing that I, I really realized and was, could, could see this over and over is what the power of fear in our country does to control people. Uh, and it controls all of us um, to, to various degrees. Um, also, the polarization um, when, when we looked at all the different stories that we heard and different perspectives, it was clear that we have a lot of work to do in this country to have conversations with each other because there were so many conflicting um, viewpoints and um, it just seems like we, we could make things a lot better. Um, the, the other interest that I have in this class, it comes from my own personal faith. I truly believe that, you know, we are most, most importantly to love God and to love our neighbors as ourselves. 
and that we are to welcome the foreigner and the stranger. And it was really clear on this trip that we have a long ways to go in addressing all the systems in this country that, that do completely something other than welcoming the foreigner and loving our neighbors. So to me, like I mentioned, this trip was very conflicting in so many ways, not only in the stories that we were being told by different people, um, but also it conflicted so much with what our understanding in this country is of what goes on. Probably um, one, one of the things that continues to bubble up is the militarization. I had no idea how militarized our country has become. And we've seen that you know, recently, in recent weeks with the decisions that have been made about dealing with our police forces that um, really way overreact to um, situations in various communities. So it, it was very problematic and heartbreaking Operation Streamline is something, you know, never anyone should ever, ever have to go through. Um, that, to me, is just so offensive to what, what we should be as human beings. Um, however, there were inspiring parts of this trip, too. I mean, John Fife and the folks that um, work with No More Deaths really, to me, are very inspiring that yes, we can all, and we must all, make a difference in this country in what's going on. We, we have to be willing, you know, we, we talked to people who welcomed folks that crossed the border into their homes even though it was against the law and they knew they could be arrested. So going forward, I, I can honestly say since the day I returned, I, it has changed me. In the conversations I have, I was at a synod assembly right after we got back. Um, we had an immigration um, proposal that was proposed, and I made some amendments to that based on things we had learned, and that was all passed. Um, just writing articles, conversations with people, I think day to day are, and then just working through opportunities f for institutions. To, to make changes in the way we live in our country. Looking up at the wall in, no, in Nogales, Mexico, If you think of a wall that is about twice the height of this room on top of a quarried wall, you feel like you're looking up into eternity. And you realize how powerful this wall has become. This wall here contains the words and thoughts of politicians, activists, writers, of churches. This wall actually reconforms to become a symbol of hope. It turns into an altar. We invite you to add your own thoughts, prayers, ideas to this wall. Um, there'll be pens. Um, it is only with our mass input and our continued energy, all of us, that we can come up with solutions that represent our generosity and our hope as emerging clergy from this school and as a nation. Thank you for listening so patiently. Uh, Loring did not mention that she's actually the artist. Uh, she's the one who conceptualized and put together this, this wall. Um, let's give our class, the whole class, a hand. Um, 
Thank you for your reflections. I hope that you heard that we confronted, um, we confronted desert and we confronted metal and we confronted the heat of the sun and um, the harshness of the wind and we confronted um, the t topography, the, the cacti. Um, I have actually uh, wounds on my arm, scars uh, from walking through the desert. Um, but most of all, I want to pick up on something that was said earlier. We confronted an ideology that I think being in the South, um, we don't necessarily have to think about on a daily basis, as some of us in the room don't have to think about uh, in the ways in which we had to think about them there um, at the border. It's a compelling trip. It's a trip that um, invites a whole body experience. It, it invites you to feel, to think, um, to use the best of your critical theology and your faith, um, and in the best of your public policy and your thinking about how policy is formed and created in this country. Um, and it invites you to really open yourself up to the other people that are with you on the trip. It's an amazing trip. I'm so glad that um, now for uh, two years I've been able to either co-lead or lead um, with others, with teaching, teaching teams. Um, we want to open it up for questions. Um, I know that we're really out of time, um, but we're certainly um, open to any of the questions, uh, any comments you, you may have that you would like to, yeah, that you would like us to, to entertain. Yeah, Brenda. Did anyone catch the first half of that? Okay. I was just at a strike earlier today, so I got my megaphone voice on. Um, I just wanted to say I'm really appreciative that Vanderbilt took this trip and it took people there to the border. Uh, but I just really wanted to open up the idea that the border is here in Tennessee, too. That we have borders that hold people back from education. You know, we have borders uh, that deport people for having a broken tail light, you know, on these streets, West and Broadway, you know. We have borders that come pick people off of their homes off Murfreesboro Road and leave children without their parents, you know, children coming home to empty houses. So um, it's easy to see these physical things. Um, and as a child, I walked through that border so many times because it was fluid and it didn't exist as it exists now. Uh, but the idea that although we can't see it, there are borders outside of these institutions, you know, that don't let students come here too. So Thank any you, of y'all want to talk about it, I'm here. I'm, but I'm also very thankful and excited that this conversation is happening in my first year here. I'm yeah. excited for the conversations we'll have in my third year. So, yeah. Thank you. I think that's an important point to make, and we do take it for granted. Um, the title of our breakfast this morning, we sort of tried to them thematize it, Shifting Borders. Um, the idea, one of the very first things that we're confronted with, Brenda, when we go out there is a talk by uh, Lupe Castillo, who's um, a local historian. She teaches at the University of Arizona, and she challenges, she really challenges a couple of notions. A, um, that, that we all have a migration story. That's the first thing. And then B, that this idea of um, property and um, the acquisition of land is, is something that needs to really be um, kept at the forefront of the conversation because she's a member of the Tahona Odom uh, Nation. And so in southwestern Arizona, um, the Tahona Odom Nation is split <laughs> now across the border. And so part um, of their uh, property, if you will, is you know, on both sides of the border. Um, and so anyway, so just getting um, us acclimated to the whole idea of the history of that particular area um, or geography, uh, region of the country, um, and how the geography in and of itself has shifted over time and what constitutes um, the U.S. and what constitutes their reservation, their 
native property and what constitutes Mexico. It's just a really, it's a, it's, you know, it's one of the things that, again, now for two years, um, because, and maybe it's because she is one of the very first voices that we hear, but it keeps compelling me to reflect on the idea of, um, of land and acquisition and property and how the United States has changed uh, through different purchases and whatnot. Um, and then what we understand, we as um, American citizens understand as being rightfully, rightfully ours um, should really again and again be, um, uh, be uh, drawn uh, under more critical and watchful um, eyes. So anyway, thank you for bringing it home, though. You're right. You know, we have our borders here in Tennessee as well. We have our borders here in Nashville. Um, so thank you. Any other comments or questions? All right. S yes, Emily. I, I I'm about to go in January with my students, and I just wanted to ask you what you would say we absolutely have to do. What, what of the things that you experienced is, is a must? I'm, I'm assuming Operation Streamline. Yeah. Okay. I don't know if it'll be too cold, but definitely that desert walk. Okay. Mm -hmm. Conversation with Southside Presbyterian Church. And John, uh, John, Fife. John Fife. Yeah. Yeah. Are you going to do homestays? Okay. Yeah. Yeah, we did. Yeah, we stayed two nights um, there in, in Nogales, Sonora. Thank you. Okay, so good to see so many of our Board of, visit, uh, board of Visitors here. Thank you for coming, and thank you, friends. We'll see you soon.